Thank you everybody for joining us. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to this GenMIG research webinar. My name is Mari McAuliffe. I'm the Chief of IOM Research. I head up the Research and Publications Division in IOM, edit the World Migration Report and uh, convene GenMIG. It's delightful to be with you today and thanks so much for joining us from wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. For those of you who are new to GenMIG, um, a little bit about and the team, Thea in particular, has prepared something uh, to take us through some of just the core components of GenMIG, which is the Gender and Migration Research Policy Action Lab, launched in March 2023 by uh, our Deputy Director General, uh, Ugochi Daniels. Uh, we're really delighted to have uh, the DG and the DDG support, uh, particularly because it's about leveraging partnerships, leveraging the expertise uh, from within IOM, but also from um, our colleagues and our partners all around the world, working in research, working in policy and practice in operations, specifically to really support uh, gender equality in migration and to help address gendered vulnerabilities through an evidence base in particular. GenMIG is supported uh, of course, by a global network. As many people know, we have now over 450 people as part of the global network and from over 300 uh, different organizations, research institutions, uh, member states, UN agencies, and other intergovernmental organizations, including the private sector. Uh, it's grown very quickly and we're really delighted to be able to uh, convene GenMIG so that we can share uh, some of the key uh, findings, evidence base, new analysis, uh, as well as, um, of course, uh, support uh, programs, operations and policy uh, change throughout the world. It is a multi-stakeholder approach and we've deliberately designed it in that way so that it can deliver gender responsive solutions. Uh, we have hosted 13 virtual events, uh, around 750 people have participated in those. We also hold uh, partner dialogues uh, and they are specifically small partner dialogues for our partner network on very specific topics that we ask our partners what they're interested in and then we'll put together um, some speakers from around the world on those. But we do big public events as well for like International Migrants Day or International Women's Day, uh, UN General Assembly opening side events and so forth. Um, we are working currently on some very exciting developments and we hope to be able to update those uh, shortly and provide some public information about some of the developments that we're working on with the private sector and also share with you our microsite, which is in development and should be available uh, next month. Recordings of events are also available on the GenMIG webpage, but there's also the QR code there that you can see on the screen. Uh, now uh, it includes the recording of the International Women's Day event that we did in partnership with the UK government, FCDO and uh, UN Women, a very interesting discussion. So I would encourage if you haven't uh, seen that already, please uh, avail yourself of the recording. It's, it's very interesting. If you'd like to join our partner network and have access to the partner dialogues and the various resources that will be available in the microsite, um, please do feel free to come back to us. There's the QR code uh, there that is being shared on the screen. You can also contact us at the email address there, research at iom.int. Uh, as well. Uh, within this context, we're starting a public webinar series, in, including out of uh, requests, of course, from various people to really share those insights in a, in a much broader sort of scale. We hope that the series really will help you in your work um, and will enable you to also to reach out to our presenters to access their work, which uh, we're delighted to be sharing with you today. And we have some more uh, research uh, webinars planned for the rest of the year. The next one will be on the 22nd of May and that will focus on access to sexual and reproductive health rights for migrant women and girls and we'll be able to share 
um, details of that uh, event shortly. You can register for that um, uh, in the chat now. And of course, if you're interested in presenting your work at one of our research webinars, please do get in touch with us. Um, we have a schedule going forward, but there's the rest of the year that we have some open spots and we're really interested, of course, in supporting work on uh, gender and migration right the way from around the world. And today we are really delighted because we have been working with the Migration for Development and Equality Hub, MIDEC, for quite some time. And we're really very pleased to have MIDEC uh, researchers who have led the work on the um, gender work stream um, uh, with us today to present uh, the key findings. Um, MIDEC, as you may know, uh, it the MIDEC hub has been um, supported, funded by the UK government, and it has been designed um, to really look at um, the global south and south-south migration and really understanding how those links across, across 12 different sort of corridors uh, have been working. It has uh, six, um, six migration corridors, three program areas, 12 different countries, as I mentioned, um, and then looking specifically at gender inequality is a particular component of their uh, work streams. This webinar today, uh, we have, well, two researchers who will be presenting and also a recording uh, from Mary Satrana who couldn't um, be with us uh, live, but we're delighted that she's been able to do a recording for us, um, is really looking at um, Ghana and China, uh, Haiti and Brazil. And the current data really does point to an increasing gender gap in migration, which we're certainly seeing across the broader sort of spectrum. And research continues to highlight how gender norms and biases continue to dictate which women actually move, uh, when they move, how they move, what their experiences um, are, of course. I will now hand over to Celine, who will introduce our speakers. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Tony um, and Tanya. And of course, Mary, we have her video. Uh, Celine uh, is Senior Research Officer with the Research Unit in the Division and uh, is integral to GenMIG. I'll hand over to Celine to uh, moderate the session. Thanks so much again for joining us. Thank you so much, Marie, and uh, hi, everybody online. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speakers today. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn first to uh, Tanya Bastia, who is Professor of, uh, of Migration and Development at the Global uh, Development Institute at the University of Manchester, where she, te she teaches international development, migration, and development and topics that relate to feminist theories and approaches. Uh, well, she has an impressive bio, so I, I invite you to check it online. Uh, but of course, she was uh, working for MIDAC, and she co-led the work package on gender inequalities with Nicola Piper and Kavita Data. So thank you so much for being here today, Tanya. It's a pleasure to have you, and I uh, give you the floor now. Thanks. Thank you, Celine, for that uh, introduction. So it's, uh, the pleasure is mine. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be here. Um, I wanted to thank you for the invitation to share some of the reflections of uh, the research process that um, I've been involved in with the MyDEC project. So I'll um, I'll just share my screen. So hopefully that that's looking okay at your end. Great. Okay. For uh, those oh, who good, are visually impaired, I haven't got many um, slides. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a middle-aged uh, woman who looks Mediterranean, and um, I'm speaking to you from my home, uh, my house. I'm not in the office today. And although we did have some sunshine this morning, I'm in the UK, just south of Manchester, uh, it's gone cloudy again, as usual. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to share some reflections from uh, the MyDEC project. Um, 
and uh, think about gender norms and how they influence migration flows. Before we come to that, well, I think that Tony and Mary have much more interesting things to say um, because they've been involved uh, with research on the ground and with data collection. Um, but the main message that I wanted to put across in, in this presentation is that, yes, gender norms, ideals and identities influence migration dynamics in terms of who migrates, how, for how long, etc. But so do class, race, ethnicity and sexuality. And an intersectional perspective is useful to go beyond some of the limitations of um, so-called gender and migration approaches. So I've been doing research in South-South migration for over 20 years when I began looking at Bolivian migrations to Argentina. And I'm sharing some photos here from my fieldwork for my PhD and my postdoc. So I started doing that around the year 2001, and it was very much a bottom-up research design, which was influenced by my observations of migration practices in a neighborhood in a peri-urban area of Cochabamba, which is a city in uh, the center of Bolivia that I was familiar with at the time. But um, this topic really also arose as an observation that much of the literature um, at the time, um, so I don't know why, I just need to go out uh, of um, the presentation for a second because uh, the skipping the slides are skipping, so I'll try again. Okay. Um, and the other observation that much of the literature at the time was mainly looking at South North migrations at the time when debates around migration and development were already starting to emerge. So I was really delighted to be invited to be part of the MIDEC project that aimed to do just that, look at specificities of South-South migration, but amplified in an amplified form with a huge team of talented and creative collaborators. Um, so the MIDEC project, the MIDEC project uh, aimed to address questions of migration, development and inequality in South-South migration. And within that project, I was co-lead of the gender work package together with Kavita Data, uh, Nicola Piper, uh, but we also worked with uh, Katia Hujo from uh, UNRIST and Matthew uh, Walsham. And we were uh, all charged with the task of synthesizing findings across uh, the different corridors that Marie uh, introduced uh, at the beginning of this webinar. So we started off with some pretty standard questions around gender and migration. And we had three main questions that we thought we were going to address. So the first one re related to migration, uh, gendered migration flows. So how gender relations influence migration flows at different levels of analysis, uh, at the individual level in terms of who migrates, how they migrate, for what types of jobs and for what reasons, at the household level in terms of the sexual division of labor and how it leads to men and women being more likely to migrate. Uh, we also thought we'd look at gender ide ideology in terms of the factors that shape mobility, the expectations of how men and women behave and whether it's acceptable for them to work outside the home uh, and or to migrate and also hiring and employment practices in terms of how labor markets function. The second kind of theme that we thought we would address was uh, related to the consequences of migration or for gender inequalities at both origin as well as destination countries, as well as places which are increasingly part of migration journey, journeys in terms of um, transit places. Um, and in, in this sense, we thought we we're going to look at economic consequences that encompass remittances, but also access to both formal and informal work in terms of who receives remittances, um, who decides what to do with them, hiring and employment practices, um, then also things related to social and family related consequences, for example, if there is a reconfiguration of gender roles as a result of migration and any changes in reproductive roles such as caring or housework, and also consequences uh, linked to uh, ideology. For example, if there is a challenge to gender ideology or sexuality, for example, for example, if it's becoming more acceptable for women to work outside the home, 
um, and or migrate for work or for other reasons. And the third area we thought we'd look at was uh, related to social networks in terms of how they are gendered. So um, which networks do men and women access and for what purpose? And do they do they draw on them in terms in times of personal crisis and the reach and scale of these networks? For example, uh, if men's networks are better resource, resourced in comparison to women's. Um, so the idea was that the corridor teams would gather the data and then work package uh, teams such as ours would synthesize and compare data across these corridors. But we, we realized quite early on that we would not be able to stick to this linear way in which the research process had been thought out. Uh, there were some changes in the corridors teams, so some started earlier, others joined later. Plus, we had the pandemic, uh, all sorts of personal, national, research-related challenges cropped up. But even more importantly, there were ethical reasons why we were uneasy with this approach. We felt that it wasn't right for us as work package researchers sitting in northern universities to play this synthesizing role across the work that our colleagues in the corridor teams were carrying out in the Global South. So uh, we had a change of practice uh, quite early on in the project. We didn't get involved in data collection or in the use of data collected by the country teams. And instead, we set up regular conversations uh, such as meetings and workshops to discuss with, with corridor teams how to take this forward. And what emerged were really interesting reflections on process and theory. That uh, is what I'd like to share with you next. Um, so, uh, and, and the kind of the core concept and the core, um, uh, yeah, theme that we worked, we ended up working around was intersectionality. We always knew that we would be interested in applying or using an intersectional perspective in our research, but this really became the core of our thinking and our reflection. So I'm sure that most of you will be aware intersectionality as a term emerged from the feminist and anti-racist movements in the US in uh, towards the end of the 1980s and was coined by Kimberley Crenshaw in an 1989 article. So Kimberley Crenshaw is here in the center of um, these uh, pictures that I'm sharing with you. And the concept really challenges the idea that gender should be at the apex of the differences and inequalities that we want to address. So it's worth remembering that although it's usually intersectionality is always uh, is um, usually thought of as a feminist concept, it is an anti-racist as much as a feminist concept. And this is something that Peter Hopkins pointed out in some of his writing. So the idea uh, that intersectionality wants to highlight is that gender inequalities are always also influenced by race, class, ethnicity, and sexuality that racism and xenophobia are uh, usually also gendered, that discrimination on the basis of sexuality also has class, race, and, and ethnic dimensions. Um, so intersectionality largely remained in academic spaces in the US and Europe for a couple of decades, but more recently it's been increasingly used by migra migrant organizations as well as by international organizations, and it's becoming very popular in academia as well. Um, the question is, to what extent is this wider uptake of intersectionality challenging its original aims and, and objectives, which are largely political rather than um, analytical? And this is something that we wanted to explore through the conversations and spaces that we created as part of the MIDEC project. And that really helped us explore whether intersectionality had traction also in, in the Global South. And there was a lot of uh, interest in intersection, intersectionality, but also some challenges. Um, so some of these related to translating some of the core concepts into other languages, uh, whether it was relevant to local context. And in most cases, the answer to this was yes. And as a work package, we wanted to take the opportunity of the project to reflect and develop a critical reading of intersectionality. And so here we followed uh, Charlene Mollett, uh, Caroline Faria, and Dina Bayou. And we explored both, both the history as well as the geography of this concept. Uh, what we argued in some of the, um, in one of the publications uh, that came out of this a couple of years ago, 
is that there is a much longer history as well as a more complex geography to the emergence of um, this term. So women uh, were already, women who were active in the civil rights movement in the US, for example, already used intersectional language at the end of the 1800s. And we've got a photograph here from of Anna Cooper, who published A Voice from the South by a Black Woman uh, in the South in 1892. There was also, uh, there is also more complex geography. Um, for example, grassroots women's uh, movements in Latin America also made intersectional like claims already um, during the 1970s. And there is another, another photograph here of Domitila Barrios de Chungara, who was a a uh, leader of um, grassroots women's movements in Bolivia. Um, and she co-wrote a book um, with Moema Vieser uh, titled Let Me Speak in 1978. Plus, we also drew on many critical voices from the Global South that challenge mainstream feminist thinking that only addresses uh, gender inequalities. For example, Chandra Mohanty or Dawn Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era. So through this work, we wanted to draw attention to the contributions that grassroots women's movement and critical thinkers in the Global South made to the emergence and eventual uptake of uh, this term. And more recently, we started working around, uh, with the concept of the migrant body. So uh, this has been in development in the last year or so. We've been exploring um, the concept of the migrant body as the way in which we can ground intersectionality in embodied experiences of South-South migration without losing sight of the wider structure that, structures that influence migration outcomes. Again, this was a bottom-up approach that emerged on the basis of collective conversations about research findings from some of the MIDEC country corridors plus a wider reading of the literature, and you've got examples of this on the slide. Uh, Emma Bond's um, take on this from literature and, and Michelle Bass uh, from anthropology, um, and also the work of Gloria Ansaldua, who grounds multiple dimensions of people's lives in her feminist analysis of borders and uh, borderlines. So this is work, this is only just uh, beginning, so uh, all I can say is There'll be more to come, um, and but you're already going to have some insights into this in Mary's and also Tony's uh, presentation. So thank you very much for uh, listening to this. You've got my contact details uh, if you, you would like to reach out, and I'll pass on back to Celine. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I see as well that uh, my colleague Thea is sharing the link uh, that you can share with us. So I invite everybody to have a look, of course, uh, after uh, this session. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody that we'll have uh, a short discussion session after the presentation. So if you have any questions or comments for the presenters, please do add your questions and comments in the chat. And I'm, I'm actually monitoring the chat and I will pass them on to our speakers. So that's it, and uh, without further waiting, I'm now delighted to invite uh, Dr. Tony Sella from the Inter-University Institute for Research and Development in Haiti to give her inputs. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Tony. Tony received her doctorate from Columbia University and is the coordinator of the Inured, uh, Inured, I don't know how you pronounce it. Yeah, is that correct? <laughs> and an affiliated scholar uh, at the University of Miami's uh, Department of Anthropology. So thank you so much, Tony, for being here. And the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Okay. Here we go. So I will be presenting the case of Haitian migration in Latin America. Uh, uh, we conducted a study, a mixed method study between 2019 and 2022. Um, and it included uh, 949 participants in five of 10 administrative regions in Haiti. Uh, social network tracing using ethnography and survey. Uh, focus groups and in-depth interviews both in Haiti and Brazil, as well as field observations. 
So uh, Haitian mobilities and migration needs to be contextualized. And I wanna do this um, from a historical perspective so that we can understand place and scale, recognizing that the past is always present. Um, historically, Latin American countries have identified themselves as a mixed race peoples, um, referred to as mestizaje, primarily of European descent, or as a European diaspora in the Americas. Uh, historically, Black and Indigenous populations in these uh, countries were vulnerable politically, socially, and economically. And this is a reality that um, persists through today. So migration policies in early and mid 19th centuries were adopted to attract Europeans to Latin American countries to encourage what in Spanish is called blanqueamento. In Portuguese, we refer to that as branqueamento or whitening of the population. So these are some of the contextualizing factors that we must um, bear in mind when we're thinking about the uh, Haitian mobility in Latin America. By Latin America, I'm specifically referring here to South uh, and Central America in particular. So after the 2010 earthquake, Haitian migration in the region substantially increased the visibility of Black bodies in some Latin American countries. Uh, plantation legacies of the Americas have rendered Haitians valuable as exploitable and menial labor. However, it also simultaneously limits opportunities for women, Haitian women in labor markets at destination. Despite them being exploitable labor that is valued in, in certain contexts, uh, their black bodies threaten the national identities, uh, Latinidad in particular, of many countries in the region. And this has resulted in the adoption of policies and practices to limit in uh, today, today uh, limit Haitian migration, whether uh, to, to, through, or uh, within Latin America, and also by extension to the U.S., which has a lot of influence on policy um, on policies related to migration in Latin America. Um, we also need to keep bear in mind that the Venezuelan migrant crisis, which is the second largest crisis with over 7.5 million refugees, has attracted much of the attention and resources in the region, making access to justice el elusive for many Haitians who are migrating in this region. So I wanted to talk about the gendered nature of migration uh, in this context. Uh, what our study results showed was that the decision to migrate is generally made by men in the family, whether a husband, a father, a partner, uncles, brothers, et cetera. And they may be in Haiti or they may be abroad at destination or in the diaspora. And by diaspora, I'm referring to the United States, Canada, uh, France, uh, et cetera. Um, men are privileged as the first to migrate and women may follow thereafter, generally through family reunification schemes. And what this has resulted in is prior to about 2017, there was probably somewhere around a three to one um, ratio of male to female migration to Latin America. Um, however, as, as of 2017, this uh, the ratio has kind of become a bit more with balance with more autonomous female migration taking place or for women pursuing higher education studies. Um, so this is a trend that is continuing. However, men still uh, migrate uh, at a higher rate to Latin America than their female counterparts. Men are perceived as having the stamina, strength and resistance necessary for the journey. And by journey, I'm referring to those who are migrating um, with undocumented status they will be transiting through, they will not fly directly to countries such as Brazil or Chile. They may transit through multiple countries in route. They're going through places like Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, um, to the northwestern uh, border of Brazil. Um, and men are also perceived as having the strength for the, la for the labor market uh, at destination. Men are perceived to have the intellectual advantages necessary to respond to challenges that may arise, if particularly if they're migrating um, with a regular status through various countries, um, as well as just dealing with any of the challenges of integration at destination. And finally, women migrating autonomously were viewed with disdain by both male and females who participated in this study. So it's important to understand that the gendered nature, nature of migration is reinforced by uh, values and beliefs held by both men and women um, in Haitian society. Um, one female interviewee said uh, the following during uh, an interview, quote, if it is a son who tells his mother or father he's migrating, he will be supported. 
The parents will sell their land, property, livestock to finance the trip, knowing that later on their son will be able to help them. If I was a son, they would encourage me to go in order to work and take care of them, end quote. So investments in male migration projects tend to be more substantial and may include the sale of family assets. Um, and it may also include contributions from family members, both in Haiti and abroad. Women's migration, on the other hand, will be supported uh, by immediate family members, usually living at destinations such as a parent, a spouse, um, et cetera, or siblings who are already at destination, although they will also benefit from contributions from uh, extended family members abroad, but on a, on a lower scale. And the sale of assets is less likely with uh, attributed to women's migration. And finally, I thought it was important to note that women's roles as caregivers play an important part of the decision-making process. So what you will find is the reason why women are not the first to leave is because they must remain in Haiti to take care of family members. And the women who are able to migrate abroad to um, be reunited with family members will play caregiving roles at destination, which are even privileged over integration in uh, the labor market at destination at, at times. So it's important that we use an intersectional approach to understand how a social controls that limits Haitian women's mobility. Um, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Haitian migrants carry the stigma of blackness in a region that is uh, that has a national national identities that are linked to their European ancestry. Um, they face assumptions regarding their social status, encounter racial biases based on colonial medical theories that relegated them to low-skilled labor-intensive jobs that local populations reject today. Um, and they have to contend with ne negative assumptions regarding their culture, you know, that they're criminal elements, degenerates, et cetera, and therefore are subjected to higher levels of surveillance. Uh, Haitian women face gender biases, uh, as we as I've discussed, you know, their subordinate status to men physically, intellectually and emotionally. Um, and Haitian women confront stereotypes writ, writ, uh, rooted in plantation legacies regarding their chastity or lack thereof and lack of virtue and their hypersexual act, uh, sexuality, which has implications for their experiences when they migrate, as well as the Haitian family or Haitian society's views about under what conditions they should migrate. So the migration process reproduces social hierarchies that reinforce the women's status, um, both in Haiti and abroad. Uh, our study found that Haitian males had higher rates of formal labor market integration and higher wages, both in Haiti and abroad at destination. Uh, Haitian women's workplaces are often gendered in Latin America, so you'll find them in restaurants or involved in domestic uh, work or care work, caregiving um, work. Haitian women's opportunities in the service industry are limited by racism. So they're generally excluded from public facing posts. So if they work in a restaurant, they will be in the kitchen if, you know, or they'll be providing cl uh, cleaning services where they're not in highly visible positions such as in stores as uh, sales clerks, et cetera. Uh, and women's migration, as I mentioned earlier, is facilitated by men reinforcing their dependence on men and at times subjecting them to predatory or outright degrading practices. And when I say, uh, how, you know, pre predation or degrading practices, I'm not only uh, alluding to the practices of men at destination who may take advantage of them um, as women, but I'm also talking about Haitian interme male intermediaries in Haiti as well as abroad at destination and in transit countries who will take care uh, advantage of them financially, may physically abuse them or uh, sexually prey on them as well. Uh, these are just a few quotes to kind of uh, highlight some of what I've discussed. I have one male interviewee in, in Haiti who said, quote, in reality, you know that women are a little weaker than men. It is easier for them to take more time and even lose, even lose their life during the journey. The first risk is, is weakness. The second risk is that there are people on the route who commit petty crimes like theft. And if they see a woman, she risks being raped. That means that the woman feels more secure when she is married. And this quote by a female interviewee, you think you will find work for a woman? There is work for men abroad, but not for women. When you arrive there, you will become a prostitute. 
you will do all kinds of things. Women will always be discouraged by their families. Um, and just to conclude, a uh, post-earthquake Haitian migration to Latin America must be examined with respect to the colonial and plantation legacies of the region. The vulnerability of Haitians migrating in the region must account for racial, national, cultural, including linguistic differences that may complicate their experiences. How black labor has and is conceived and exploited in the region must be acknowledged as well as its implications for labor market integration along gender lines. Promoting access to justice for Haitians facing these unique challenges requires acknowledging the distinct experiences of all genders and making a commitment to protect the vulnerable even in the face of a regional migrant crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. That was very interesting. And I'm sure like uh, the different attendees will have uh, questions in the chat coming up. Uh, again, let me invite everybody to ask any questions or comments. I do have questions actually and comments, <laughs> more questions, uh, uh, but I'll keep this for myself for the time being because uh, we want to hear from you and from our colleague, Mary, who uh, Dr. Mary Satrana, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, as Mary mentioned previously, but she kindly share a recording of her intervention uh, so let me nonetheless uh, introduce her to you. Uh, Mary Satrana is a senior lecturer at the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana. She has been a consultant and expert for various international organizations, and she is an advis advisory board member of the African Research Universities Alliance Center of Excellence on Migration and Mobility. So many thanks to my colleague, Michaela, who will now uh, play the recording of uh, Mary's intervention. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. I'm presenting part of the gender results from the MIDEC work package. And I'm I've titled my presentation, Gendered Migration of Chinese to Ghana, the Significance of Ghana as a Place. A bit of background to Chinese migration to Ghana. So the relationship between Ghana, China, could be traced back to the 1950s. And Ghana's relationship with China has evolved over time, moving from the ideological state to a more development-oriented uh, moment or season. Despite the long-standing relationship, data on Chinese immigrants in Ghana are inconclusive because of the absence of formal records from these statistics. The lack of data presents a number of challenges, including the death of information on the gendered migration process of Chinese in Ghana. Instead, Chinese migrants are treated as homogeneous groups in most of the discussions. The presentation focuses on the gendered migration of Chinese to Ghana as a destination area and decision-making processes. For methodology, it's a broader methodology for the entire project, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm focusing on the interviews that we had with Chinese immigrants who live in Ghana. So the key issue, some of the key issues coming up is opposing Chinese migration to Ghana during the migration decision-making processes. And so generally, it was realized, it's realized that women relatives were quick to oppose the intention of China, their relatives who were Chinese to want, and wanted to migrate to Ghana. So whether you are a son, a daughter, a husband, or a wife, it was easy for you, either your, if your wife, your mother, or your auntie to wonder why you want to move from China to Ghana. And unfortunately, some of these, um, negative perceptions are because there is negative media reports on China, on Ghana in China. So the negative reports report the creates that negative perception among Chinese who live in Ghana. And so when people want to migrate, that becomes a hindrance. Ghana was described in most of the discussions as a culture with a different a country with a different culture, which is normal, different weather conditions, uh -huh. very distant from Ghana because China is so far away. 
language barrier. They see that as an, a problem. Some feel that Ghana is insecure for their Chinese immigrants, uh, Chinese relatives to move from China to Ghana. And some of them were described as being inexperienced to move from China and come and live in an insecure place like Ghana. So these are negative perceptions that family members had concerning their relatives' decision to move to Ghana. And so one of the interviews says, my mother was not too happy. She generalized issues in some African countries and concluded that Africa is not safe to raise children. The bad news we always saw and heard about the continent. So it tells you the kind of information that China presents, the China media or maybe social media, whichever platforms presents concerning Ghana. Again, the meaning of Ghana. So you want to come to Ghana as a destination area. How does, what does Ghana mean to you? And so as speaking with qualitatively, we also noticed that despite the negative perceptions and worries of family members, the respondents themselves, the immigrants, the Chinese immigrants themselves were optimistic about their journey to Ghana and overcame those opposition from family and friends. And so we're asking, so why do you still want to come to Ghana? Complex reasons led to this. So mainly economic for both men and women, but it was mostly for economic reasons when it came to the male Chinese immigrants. But then for the women, mainly it's family. And then after that, they begin to express concerns of economic reasons. So according to D, he considered other economic factors. She considered other economic factors. She considered the economic struggles she and her husband would have to go through living apart with their children and decided to join the husband to Ghana. Again, for some male Chinese, the economic and political context were the very crucial factors that influenced their decision to move to Ghana. The differences in democratic system of Ghana, which is so different from Chinese political system, inform some of their decisions. Seeking to achieve the African dream. So for some Chinese immigrants, the African dream is conceptualized as entrepreneurship and participation in the development of the African continent. So what were the gendered issues when it comes to Chinese migration to Ghana? So here, the, in terms of the decision-making processes, it's went through several stages. Primarily, the individual was the main point of decision-making. So the individual makes the decision and then discusses with the family. So you find women making decisions independently of their husband to move to Ghana and then later discuss with their families and join their families to Ghana. So the, although it's an individual decision, the individual is rational, the migrant is taking decisions, the final decision, it has to still come from the household level. So the decision was usually made by immediate family members and agreed on together with the immediate family members. Again, there were some instances where decision was also taken on behalf of the migrants. So this happens if the Chinese family finds the migration of the younger ones as a means for household risk diversification. And so, for instance, in the case of Ada, whose father had a business in Ghana and found that very soon he would be retiring. So without Ada's consent, she was asked to come to Ghana. And so she's a recipient of the decision made on her behalf by her parents and should not play an active role when it came to decision-making. Again, so it goes back to some of the issues we talk about that, yes, the men were able to move, but the women sometimes have to push. So in this case, um, she had to, irrespective of what her decisions were, because of the family decisions, she had to move. Again, there is also a business level decision-making process. So here, the male Chinese migrants were not involved when it comes to those who were employed and had to be transferred. So some of them said they came, it wasn't their consent, they, they were, their consent was not sought, but the business felt that they needed to expand to Ghana. And so they asked them to come to Ghana. 
most of these people were males and to them asking their companies asking them to Ghana was an expression of reward to them by their company for them to be trusted by their company to move to a transnational space in order to expand their companies so we're asking them again gender and Ghana as a space to Chinese migrants does it help I mean looking at your expectations fulfilling the migration dream how do you find it and so some of the responses were Coming to Ghana has improved our economic and social living conditions than when we were in China. So some of them, before some of the, them said before coming to Ghana, my economic and social conditions condition was okay, but comparatively, Ghana is better for me economically. I receive more money here in Ghana. Then another point is Ghana provides me with a job that matches my qualification. So here skills match. And so one of them, one some of the interviews, he said, when I was in China, I was not working in my field of studies, but in Ghana, I am supervising construct in a construction firm. And I am fulfilled here in Ghana than when I was in China. Again, some also feel that the African dream, which is achieving the entrepreneurial skills among Chinese both male and female, but particularly female migrants, was achieved. I have, and one of them said, I have my own business that my husband has established on my, on my behalf. And so these are some of the, the fulfilling dreams, despite the initial opposition they faced in Ghana. And despite, so what Ghana means to them as the space where they find empowerment, they find satisfaction. So what does this lead us in terms of conclusions and reflections? So yes, Chinese migration to Ghana is gendered in terms of the reasons, the processes, the household decision is still key. Although some agencies are taken from people, but they still interpret it as a good decision eventually. And so here we we can say that we can say that employ, employees. So usually we don't talk about employees, but employees are increasingly determining the gender norm. So they determine who stays and who moves. So particularly in the case of the men who said their businesses transferred them, they still have to go and discuss with the family. But again, they didn't have a choice in it. Mm -hmm. The good thing is they saw it as a, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But again, it changes the gender dynamics in the home, who takes up the different roles. So that's something that mm -hmm. as um, policymakers, as researchers, we need to be mindful of the family reunification. The female is still seen as a vulnerable person in the migration journey. And this needs further sensitization in both the origin and destination countries and among migrant groups. And so in some of the interviews, as I, sh I showed, so the, the female is asked to go, she's going because she's going to take over the family business. But again, some people are described as inexperienced. So the woman is not supposed to go too far. I mean, as from the beginning of migration, but we've moved beyond that. And so she needs some um she 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 doesn't need to be in a vulnerable situation but we need we need to look at the the autonomy the economic contribution of these female chinese migrants which is very important and based on that we need to recognize the important and positive contribution of immigrants and make gender responsive policies labor migration policies especially um, in Ghana and in other parts, and even in China as well, so that the policies can take into consideration the concerns and needs of such women. And then both female and male Chinese migrants found that migrating to Ghana has a positive impact on their lives, which enhances South South migration discourse. Enhancing migration education and campaigns through the diaspora network is also very key to encourage South South migration. And so these are some of the um, issues that we have been able to tease out from the work in relation to the presentation. Thank you very much. And a big thank you uh, to Mary Citrana Ivan Pashi, who wasn't able to be with us for kindly recording this uh, this intervention. I see that there are questions in the chats, and I see as well, I'm mindful of the time. 
um, that said, um, I saw that uh, one of the questions was already answered by you, Tanya, uh, and there'd be more to be said on that uh, by Tony, but perhaps if I can I get the 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 core of the questions that I see, uh, I see there's a, a question by Chali Tayed, I'm sorry for my pronunciation if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Chali, uh, who's more uh, perhaps addressed to uh, Tony, um, and the question is more about, let me go back to the questions, uh, I think is more in terms of evolutions of social norms as well. If we do, as you say, uh, Chali, and you mm, comment if I understand correctly, that is more women migration, um, uh, an increasing number of women who migrate uh, in Ethiopia, from Ethiopia to the Middle East, for instance, and asking whether uh, lack of uh, interest to marriage or more focusing on uh, academic independence seems to be a triggering factor. So I'm thinking here in terms as well on the impact of social norms and if we had with the recent evolution. And I think uh, the question came when you presented, Tony, but may also uh, well be answered by Tanya as well. So I'll give you two, uh, the possibility to answer that. And I see there's a second question by um, Jean-Pierre Gauthier, who's uh, more formulating, and I won't go into detail here, but formulating this question with respect to uh, informal labor sectors. Um, so I don't know if uh, Tanya and Tony, you'd like to speak to these two aspects, perhaps briefly, uh, if I give you a, a two minutes. I know it's a, <laughs> it's a very short, uh, uh, very short uh, time frame for such big questions, but uh, thank you for that. And there's more coming in the chat, but unfortunately, we'll see if we can come to that. Perhaps, Tanya, if we keep the order of presentation, if that's fine with you. Um. Yeah, so I didn't quite get the first question. I'll answer the question about the formal informal. Um, so the question was whether uh, we can use intersectionality to look at um, formal and informal labour. And I, I think, I mean, it's a very quick answer that yes. So I, I, don't, got, I don't think I've got any specific um, advice on uh, how you would apply an intersectional perspective specifically for formal or informal work. Um, I think one of the problems with intersectionality is that it doesn't really have, it doesn't really have a specific methodology that goes with it. So it's um, it's one of the things that uh, it's the beauty of it, but also a challenge because it 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 means that um, um, every intersectional approach approach needs to come up with a specific um, methodology, uh, that, that deals, you know, that's specific to that, uh, to that particular study, um, and, uh, or, or intervention. Um, so there is nothing specific about formal informal work that, uh, links to intersectionality, but it can definitely be applied. Um, and, uh, I, I, I didn't quite get the yeah. first question. For the other one, I think it's more has to do with the evolution of social norms that could, because we see in certain migration corridors, there may be an increase of, of women migrating independently for uh, rather as 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 a, as a migrant worker, for instance, and in the first instance, and then the family may reunite. And I think it's it's linked as well to what you say, Tony, that uh, there's been, uh, there, there has been more uh, women migrating from uh, Haiti, even though like it's still, uh, apparently not to the point that it's on parity at all with uh, Ivan Mel. So I don't know, Tanya, if you see something as well, more generally in your research that you yeah. like I to speak to in terms of social question, norms. I and... think if uh, Tony will, will have more material yeah. for that question, so I'll pass on to you, Tony. Fantastic, thanks. Um, just quickly, um, I agree with Tanya, you know, in terms of intersectionality, there are so many ways you can look at this. So as someone who's researching Haitian migration in Latin America, you know, I might look at, you know, for uh, levels of engagement in formal and informal sector of different type of migration, migrant population. So Haitian, Venezuelan, Bolivian, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it depends on how you want to look at it. But I'd also be thinking about the fact that in Haiti, we actually have a higher level of labor market integration of women than men as entrepreneurs, but they're in the informal market. So in many ways, women are probably reproducing that in 
Brazil or in Chile because that is what they knew in Haiti. Um, and if as, my, uh, as people who are either undocumented or still working on their paperwork or still acclimating, you know, learning the language. So it is very likely that they would engage, you know, in the informal sector to begin with. So there's so many ways to look at that. Um, with regards to the evolution of social norms, um, I'm actually familiar with the work that's been done on uh, labor migration of Ethiopian women and how that impacts, you know, their cultural, social uh, values uh, when they return home into Ethiopia. And so the same is true. I think that encounters with new destination countries and new opportunities definitely in, uh, impact behaviors. Um, it may not necessarily change core values. However, as we see with the Haiti case, since 2017, women have been the uh, women have increasingly migrated alone, autonomously to pursue education and even to pursue employment opportunities. Um, so while there isn't parity uh, in terms of migration, we are definitely seeing an uptick, and I wouldn't be surprised if we are, you know, headed towards parity parity within the next, you know, 10 to 20 years. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I see there's more questions in the chats. Uh, and uh, let me look at the time as well, because I think we're going to miss, um, we're going to be too long on the ways. And I'm very sorry for the very interesting questions that are coming up. Uh, as I was inviting you to ask questions, and you all did. And um, thank you so much. And please do engage with our speakers uh, bilaterally. I think there's no issue for uh, either of you, Tanya or Tony, as you, you did share. Uh, your email contacts, uh, as I'm sorry, we won't be able to cover all the questions. And I know there's um, uh, some uh, last remarks that are going to be uh, made, concluding remarks by Mary McAuliffe, the head of the division as well. Uh, but let me thank you again uh, very much. And I hand over to Mary. Thank you so much indeed. Thanks so much to Tanya, to Tony, thanks Celine, and to Mary in absentia um, for their fantastic presentations. It was a very short Q&A in the end, but um, certainly very interesting and lots of really rich material, of course, in the chat. Uh, the links encourage you to have a look at that material, reach out to us, reach out to the uh, presenters. Um, there's so much work that is being done. There's so much uh, very important work to share. And we've really been very privileged to have uh, MIDAC join us and to share their insights from those very, you know, important and rich areas, geographic areas that are often neglected in migration research. So a real delight to be able to, to share that with you today. A couple of um, mentions again, the next uh, GenMig research uh, webinar, as I mentioned, is on the 22nd of May. The registration link is in the chat. If you are not part of our partner network, but interested in joining, we do have um, our next uh, partner dialogue on domestic workers, um, women domestic workers and protection. And that is on the beginning of May, the second, I think it is. So please do feel free to join us. We've got a, a lineup of very, very interesting speakers from around the world. Um, so again, get in touch if you're interested in joining. Thank you again for joining us, for listening, for learning. I hope it sparked some reflections regarding your own work and has encouraged you to, to reach out to some of the best researchers in the world. We're really delighted to, to have you with us today, Tanya, Tony, and of course, Mary, uh, who went to great lengths to do a video for us. So I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, please feel free to reach out to us and we look forward to seeing you at the next um, GenMig research webinar. Thank you again so much.